The Cavalcade of America, starring Lee Bowman and Una Merkel. Tonight, the DuPont Company, at the special request of many of its listeners, brings you a rebroadcast of The Stirring Blood, starring Lee Bowman and Una Merkel, on The Cavalcade of America. First, here is Gane Whitman. Good evening. Whether your car is nine years old, the average age of America's family car, or the newest model off the production lines, its general appearance will be improved by the application of a DuPont polish or wax. To quickly remove traffic film, restore color and luster, we recommend DuPont Number no. 7 polish, the liquid cleaner and polish that's easy on the arm. If, however, you want the ultimate in protection, Plus a long-lasting luster, clean the car first with DuPont Duco Cleaner. Then polish it with Duco Wax. These number seven automotive products are examples of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Now, The Stirring Blood, starring Lee Bowman as Dave Evans and Una Merkel as Opal on The Cavalcade of America. Care where he is. Get him here. Get Dave Evans, Evans in this office in three minutes or I'll fire the whole staff. You heard me. City desk. Oh, Collins. Good. You'll do. Now, look. Get out to LaGuardia Airport right away. There's a plane due in from London. I want you to wait for him. Hiya, Chief. Well, well, well. Dave Evans, I've been trying to get hold of you for an hour. What are you, a reporter? Or... I got your message at the hospital and came as soon as I could get away. Hospital? What's the matter, sick? No, get no. Get sick on your own time. No, but I... I got... had to send Collins out to LaGuardia to cover a story that should have been your assignment. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got a story right here in my pocket. Big, page one. Yeah? Well, okay, okay. Let's have it. I just came from the hospital. Eyewitness. A miracle. And I got the whole thing exclusive. Save the build up. Give me the story. Okay, here it is. A scoop. By applying the RH blood factor... They've solved a case of erythroblastosis. What was that? Erythroblastosis. Are you gagging? I'm giving you a page one scoop. For what, the encyclopedia? I'm telling you I've got a story. It's one of the greatest medical miracles that ever happened. What's the matter with you? Best man on the staff and suddenly you go crazy over some crackpot medical item. Crackpot? It's the most fantastic life-saving miracle that ever happened. But it is a news, Dave. This is a newspaper. Chief, it's the biggest news since Noah struck land. Dave, will you get out of here before I throw you out? You've got to listen to this, Chief. It's a miracle. I saw it happen. When you get a baby with erythroblastosis... Ah! Go ahead, bust the furniture, tear your hair, but I'm going to write this story. And what's more, I'm going to do a Sunday feature on it. And if you don't want to even listen to it, I'll write it for somebody else. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Where are you going? Out the door. Oh, I quit. Cut it out. Now, don't be so touchy. Sit down, sit down. I'll listen to it, but I won't understand it. Dave, this is a newspaper, not a doctor's quarterly. There's no way to get that scientific stuff clear to our readers. How about giving me a chance? Are you kidding why, the readers would get to the second syllable of that word, er 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 erythroblastosis. Yeah, then they turn to the comic page. Listen, see that girl out there at the third desk? Which one? The one with a toothpick. What about her? Well, she's the dumbest blonde in this office. Now, give me ten minutes with her, and if I can't get this story through her head in that time, I'll, I'll spend the rest of my newspaper days on the society page. Is that a deal? Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. You're going to explain this thing to Opal? Not only explain it, but I'll make her understand it. You got yourself a deal. Wait a minute. Opal! Opal! Hey, wake up! Did you call me, Chief? Yes, come in here a minute. Okay, Dave. She's all yours. Thanks, Chief. Now, wait just a minute. What is it? Dave will tell you. Dave will tell me what? Uh, it's, uh, it's all right, Opal. Now, uh, sit down. Have some uh, gum? No, thanks. I'm chewing some. Look, uh, Opal, Dave uh, wants to tell you a little story. It's about the R.H. blood factor and the erythrith, erythrith, erythroblastosis. <laughs> what? <laughs> See? She's hysterical already. Uh, just a minute, Chief. Opal. Huh? That's, uh, that's a beautiful ring you've got. Mm -hmm. uh, engaged? Mm-hmm. To my man. Oh, fine, fine. That's good, Opal. But uh, did you know that before you get married, you ought to find out what kind of blood your man has? Blood? It's red, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, honey. But, but I, I don't mean that. I mean before you marry, you ought to find out his R.H. factor and your R.H. factor. Are you kidding? No, Opal, I, I'm very serious. 
You see, if, if a woman's blood is what they call R.H. negative and a man's R.H. positive, there's danger their children may not live. Oh, you mean that could happen to me and my man? That's right. If you're R.H. negative and he's R.H. positive. Well, I know he's awful positive about certain things. Well, you're off to a great start. No, no, Opal, I, I don't mean that. Then what are you talking about? We're not sick, if that's what you mean. No, no, no. This thing happens to perfectly healthy people. Opal, are you listening? Huh? Oh, sure, sure. We're healthy, but we're not healthy. Two minutes are up, Dave, and you're not on first base yet. Uh, now, now, Opal, just, just remember this. There's blood that's R.H. negative mm -hmm. and R.H. positive. Mm -hmm. You got that? Sure. Negative and positive. Just the opposite to each other. Mm. Sure, genius. Listen, Opal. Before we start on that big word, erythroblastosis, we've, we've got to work backwards. First types of blood, and second, the R.H. factor in blood. Now, uh, here, take another stick of gum and relax. You see, Opal, inside us, there's a wonderful organ called the heart. It beats steadily, quietly. And because it beats, the blood flows through our bodies. It seems so simple. Oh, but blood isn't simple. Because somewhere in the blood lie murderous elements. Back in 1900, they gave transfusions. They thought blood was just blood. Everybody's the same. If a man needed blood, they gave him a transfusion. But it didn't always work. Why, the same blood that saved one man on Sunday would kill another on Monday. What was this killer in the blood? Doctors were baffled. Now, there was one particular doctor. His name was Karl Lonsteiner. He and other doctors worked night and day in the laboratory trying to track down this killer in the blood, trying to learn why a transfusion saved one life and snuffed out the next. Robert, that makes 10 samples of blood from 10 different people, including you and me. Yes, sir. 10 centimeters each. So, we have 10 different bloods. Huh? We'll start with a simple experiment. Your blood we will use first. Get me four test tubes. There they are, sir. We're going to divide your blood into five equal parts. Two cubic centimeters in each tube. Correct. We leave 2cc in the original test tube. We keep that pure and unmixed. The others we'll mix with different bloods. The next one is Arthur's blood. We'll pour two cubic centimeters of his blood into yours. Mark this one, Robert Arthur, and put it on the rack. The next one is Lillian's. We'll pour 2cc of her blood into yours. Mark it, Robert Lillian. <laughs> Nine, 40. There we are, Doctor. 40 mixed and 10 unmixed. Uh -huh. Now the microscope, Robert, please. Yes, sir. No, I will get it. I have something I want to get with me. Dr. Landsteiner. Doctor, look. What is it, Robert? What's the matter? Look what's happened to this mixed sample. Mine and Joseph's. The blood is clumped, all clumped up. That's funny. And the next one, Joseph and Lillian's, that too. There's nothing wrong with this one, Joseph's and Arthur's. Mm, clumping of blood. What happened, Doctor? Happened. Robert. Robert, of course, don't you see? Some bloods will mix and some won't. Well, that's what it looks like. That's what it's got to be. Why, if this thing happened in the body, the person would die. It does die. The transfusions that fail. Exactly. We've got the beginning of the answer to the problem of transfusions. Why, why it's so simple. Some bloods will mix, some won't. <laughs> oh, simple, Robert. Well, isn't it? No, I don't think so. There is always the big word, why? Why does it happen? You see, now we must find out what it is that causes this this fatal clumping of the blood cells. Quickly now, Robert, the microscope. Well, Opal, that was the start. The first step, and a big one. Now, they knew that there were different kinds of blood, and one kind wouldn't mix with another, like uh, oil and water. Get it? Oh, sure, like the Red Cross has, the ABC types. Exactly. Only there are, there are four types. And every person, regardless of race or color, belongs to one of those four different blood groups. A, B, AB, and group O. Anybody knows blood types, that's easy. Easy? Well, Opal, maybe it sounds easy now, but it took years just to find it out. Dr. Lonsteiner and his assistants worked until they found the different types. The discovery was so important and saved so many lives that Dr. Lonsteiner was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1930. 
Well, it looked as though the killer in the blood was found. Caught. For good. In 1937, Dr. Rufus Stetson, in charge of blood transfusions at Bellevue Hospital, New York, had a patient who had severe reactions on being transfused with her husband's blood. Dr. Stetson sent to the Blood Transfusion Association in New York for donors. Sixty donors were tested and only eight proved compatible. But the patient's life was saved. Dr. Eugene Katzen of the Blood Transfusion Association then sent the blood for continued study to Dr. Philip Levine at the Newark Beth Israel Hospital. Dr. Levine was a former pupil of Dr. Lonsteiner's. When Dr. Levine reported to Dr. Stetson... I'd like to talk to you about this patient of mine, Dr. Levine. As you may know, she had just lost her baby. She reacted so violently to the transfusion that it had to be terminated. No error in grouping? Everything was checked and cross-checked. It was her husband's blood. And they were both of the same group. Hmm. I'm puzzled by the origin of these unusual antibodies in the mother's blood. But I've got a theory, Dr. Stetson. Was this her first transfusion? Yes. Hmm. Well, I believe the baby had a new blood factor, inherited from the father and lacking in the mother. Minute quantities of the baby's blood found their way into the mother's circulation. Because the factor was absent in the mother's blood, the infant's blood was therefore foreign to her. And she responded by producing an antibody, just as any person responds when injected for any disease. That sounds reasonable. We have to study this further. Dr. Levine and Dr. Stetson knew there was a strange factor in the blood, one they hadn't named. Two years later, Dr. Lonsteiner was working with one of his associates, Dr. Weiner. Uh, Dr. Lonsteiner, will you look at a patient of mine? Transfusion trouble? Well, not with the first three, but the fourth uh, patients in here. Well, Mr. Gordon, feeling better? Oh, yes, thanks, Dr. Weiner. Good. Uh, Mr. Gordon, this is Dr. Lonsteiner. Hello, Doctor. How do you do? Uh, Mr. Gordon, I want to ask you a few questions. First, did you get a backache during the transfusions? Uh, yes. Chills? Well, I shook like a leaf. Fainted a couple of times. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Gordon. I will stop in later. Well, Doctor? Mr. Gordon has definite signs of incompatibility of blood. I know, but the blood matched. Mr. Gordon's was group A, so was the donor's. There's something in the blood we don't know about. Something besides the grouping we already know. I think so, too. And there's only one thing we can do. Continue our research until we find out what it is. Now, Opal, you've got it straight? First, Dr. Lonsteiner found out that there were different blood types. Some went together like, well, ham and eggs. Good, I mean. But the other ones, even if they were the same group, blew it. That's right. Various doctors, working independently, learned that sometimes group A blood didn't work with the same group in another person. Three out of every hundred cases went wrong. Look, Dave, what's the gimmick? Gimmick? You won't believe it when I tell you. Why not? Because the gimmick is a monkey, a rhesus monkey. <laughs> oh, I never get tired watching these little clowns. <laughs> they are delightful. But we have work to do, Dr. Vino. All right. Now, six weeks ago, we injected five cc's of a rhesus monkey's blood into a guinea pig. Mm -hmm. I've drawn off the serum from the guinea pig and divided it into 12 test tubes. And we have 12 different samples of human blood. That's right. All right. Let's add one cc of different human blood to each tube of the serum. All right, I'll work from this end. You can start from where you are. Yes. No reaction from this first tube. None here. And the second. Or here. Or the third. Or here. And the fourth. Or, or the here. fifth. Look here, Dr. Uh, Lanson. Uh, this one. My blood is beginning to clump. There is a reaction. There must be something else in the blood so that no matter what the blood group is, there must be another factor that can kill. You are listening to Lee Bowman as Dave Evans and Una Merkel as Opal in The Stirring Blood on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, 
maker of better things for better living through chemistry. In an effort to persuade his editor to run a feature story on the R.H. factor in blood, Dave Evans, reporter, is telling the story to Opal, one of the girls in the office. Dave continues. So, Opal, Dr. Lonsteiner and Dr. Weiner named the new factor in the blood, the R.H. factor. They used the first two letters of Rhesus. Named it after the monkey. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, most people have the R.H. factor in their blood, so they're called R.H. positive. Uh-huh. Those who don't have it are called R.H. negative. I see. And nowadays, when they give transfusions, they, they not only match blood type, but also the R.H. factor. Well, if a person who's R.H. negative gets a transfusion of R.H. positive blood, does he die? Well, uh, not at the first transfusion, unless the person is a mother. But you just said they had a match. Yeah, I, I know. I know, but there's this. R.H. negative blood hates R.H. positive. It puts up a battle. But R.H. positive blood. Oh, so the negative wins. Then what? Aha, uh-huh, that's where you're wrong, Opal. The R.H. negative wins the battle at first. The enemy is dead. Sure. But thousands upon thousands of the dead enemy are floating down the arteries. Oh. And what happens? This. The dead enemy clogs and clumps, literally chokes the life out of the victor. So it's no victory at all. How do you like that? Mr. Evans, tell me about when I get married. Oh, wait a minute, Opal. I, I've got to clear up one more thing first. Now, suppose an R.H. negative person gets a transfusion of R.H. positive blood. What happens? Well, you just told me there's lots of trouble the second time. Good. But now remember... I said that most transfusions worked even before the R.H. factor was discovered. I remember. You know why? Because if you're R.H. positive and get a transfusion of R.H. negative, there's no trouble at all. No matter how many transfusions you get, and 85 out of 100 people are R.H. positive. Oh, I get it. That makes only 15 out of 100 people R.H. negative. Right. So if there's 100 transfusions, maybe 85 of them would be R.H. positive, and they could take either negative or positive without conking out. Opal, I love you. Well, it'd be like having 85 red hats in a room with 15 green ones, and if you had to reach in in the dark and grab one, you'd probably get a red one because there are more of them. Sure, sure. Before the R.H. factor was discovered, it, it was like reaching in the dark. I get that, but... Now, how about me getting married and having babies? Well, that's my last point. What happens to a baby if one parent is R.H. negative and the other is R.H. positive? Does he die? That's what the doctors had to find out. Does the blood of the unborn baby fight the blood of the mother? Does the blood of the mother kill the baby? Well, one day, Dr. Lonsteiner's former pupil, Dr. Philip Levine, now at the Ortho Research Foundation, called on him. <laughs> you seem to be in a hurry, Levine. Just excited, Doctor. I want to tell you something about an unexpected finding of mine. Yes? It's an outcome of my research with Dr. Stetson. You see, I've been spending a lot of time on erythroblastosis. Yes, I know. Actually, you and I have been working independently on the same R.H. factor. Now, I've been able to prove that a baby's R.H. positive blood can find its way into the R.H. negative mother's bloodstream. You have? Yes. The mother suffers from severe reactions if she's transfused for the first time with the blood of her R.H. positive husband. Then you mean that the mother responds to the baby's R.H. positive blood? Exactly. Her R.H. negative blood produces antibodies, which in turn... Destroy the transfused blood. Precisely. Now, what's still more interesting is the fact that the women in all the cases I speak of give histories of having had babies with erythroblastosis. Babies who appear normal eventually develop jaundice or anemia? They do. And those babies are sick because the mother's antibodies destroy the baby's positive blood. This is an important discovery, Levine. Look, I'd like to have you meet my associate, Dr. Weiner. He and I have given this factor the name R.H., but we did not realize the connection between it and your first case with Dr. Stetson. This is very important, Levine. I congratulate you. And so, Opal... The work of Dr. Levine led straight to the fact that there was a connection between erythroblastosis and the R.H. factor. Gee, you mean if I'm negative and my man is positive, we can't have any kids? Well, your first two children will be all right. Levine showed that. You see, it it takes time for the R.H. negative mother to build the armies that attack the R.H. positive blood. But Dave, what happens if there are more than two children? 
I guess they die. No, no, not necessarily. Even now, they, they don't know everything. There's lots to be learned about these factors. They only know that sometimes the unborn baby's blood gets into the mother's bloodstream. Uh, then again, the mother's and the baby's blood don't get together at all. In that case, the RH negative mother can keep having healthy RH positive children. So, uh, don't be scared, Opal. Have all the children you want. But, gee, what are the chances of my baby having that... The, what's that word? Uh, erythroblastosis? Oh, yes. Well, the chances are only one in three or four hundred. What if that chance comes up, Dave? Ah, uh, that's where the biggest miracle of all comes in. Can that child be saved? Well, listen. Listen. <laughs> Glad you got here in time, Dr. Weiner, with only a few minutes. The child isn't born yet, Dr. Levine? No, not yet. This way, please. I'll fill you in briefly. This woman about to have her third child. What's her factor? RH negative. In here, please. We'll scrub up first. Right. You, uh, you said the mother's RH negative. And the father? Positive. Well, what about the first two children? Well, the first, perfectly normal. Second, born dead. This third one... Well, death is almost certain unless we can do something about it. Well, we can try, Dr. Levine. You've shown us that erythroblastosis is brought on by the two different RH factors of the parents. We've got to transfuse the baby immediately with RH negative blood. Wait. Why shouldn't we draw out all the child's blood and replace it? That might save it. Draw out the child's blood and replace it? Well, yes, of course we'll do that. It's the right way, I'm certain. We're ready. 300 cc's of RH negative blood to use if it's necessary. But we'll take a test of the infant's blood first. I've explained it to the obstetrician. He's cooperating with us all the way. This is girl, Dr. Levine. Seems all right. Oh, let me look at her. She looks normal, Dr. Weiner, but her skin color... Yeah, bronze. Usually a sign of blood disease. Better take a blood count right away. Yes, that's indicated. She's getting pale. Her breathing's shallow, rapid. No time for a blood count. Nurse, the syringe valve. We'll draw off the blood and inject fresh blood right now. Yes, sir. Right here, Doctor. How much is that now? 250 cc's of new blood. Her color's coming back. Heartbeat? Stronger. Hemoglobin level, 75%. She, she's out of danger. <coughs> nurse, you can take her back to the nursery now. She'll be all right. <coughs> They did that, Opal. Like the kid was a crankcase and they were changing oil for the winter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wait till I tell my boyfriend. And, well, say, Mr. Evans, how do you know so much about it? How do I know? I'll tell you. My wife's RH negative. I'm RH positive. And Opal, that was my baby the doctors saved. Gee, think of that. It's terrific. Wonderful. Well... Is there a story in it, Chief? It took a little longer than ten minutes, but... Take as long as you want on a day, but write that story. Does it make a Sunday feature? Yes. Go ahead. All right. I want to write about those men of the medical profession, the hospital staffs, the research workers. I want people to know how much we owe to the doctors who work quietly, year after year, beating back death, rescuing lives by the million, conquering the unknown. Opening another medical frontier. Here, a, a baffling, terrifying puzzle that confronted the world for years has at last been solved through painstaking effort of scientific research. Again in America, a challenge has been met and another fear banished. I'm going to sing about these doctors in headlines. They made the blood flow again. They made the heart beat firmly and surely. Here is Gane Whitman speaking for DuPont. Medical science has made more progress in our time, many physicians believe, than in all the centuries of history until now. All science has taken a great leap ahead during these past few decades. By and large, the chemical industry, which, as you know, is founded on chemical science, 
is a real treasure house for the science of medicine. Often a compound manufactured by a chemical company, like DuPont, is sold to a drug manufacturer. He uses it in making the products your doctor prescribes for you, and your local pharmacist hands to you over the drugstore counter. A number of important drugs widely used today by physicians came originally from the laboratories of the chemical industry. The first sulfur drug, to name one, was not born in a hospital, but in a dye stuffs laboratory. Then there's another way chemical products enter the service of medicine. A specific product like DuPont nylon yarn may be used to make a delicate filter or blood plasma. Surgical sutures are made of nylon filament. Even such a well-known friend as DuPont cellophane acts as a barrier to germs in surgical dressings. Cellophane has also been used in surgery after operations around tendons and joints. A small sheet of it placed between bones where cartilage has been removed prevents the ends of the bones from adhering and greatly reduces the pain of bending the joint after the operation. And any adequate account of the relation between health and chemistry would have to mention DDT, which controls many insects, and ANTU, which destroys brown rats. Both insects and rats are known carriers of many diseases. So it is that with the know-how of the DuPont Company and other chemical companies, many compounds are made which in one way or another lend themselves to medicine and health. We think you will agree that such compounds deserve the verbal blue ribbon we bestow upon them when we speak of them as DuPont better things for better living through chemistry. Carrie Thomas was graduated from Cornell, and her father thought she should give up this scholastic nonsense and get married. But Carrie entered Johns Hopkins. There, she was refused a degree, but Carrie did something about it. Fiery, indomitable, she fought back and became... Well, listen to her story next Monday to Lady of Distinction, starring Ida Lupino on The Cavalcade of America. The music for the DuPont Cavalcade is composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Tonight's Cavalcade was written by Sigmund Miller and Halsted Wells. Lee Bowman appears through the courtesy of Columbia Pictures, producers of the Technicolor musical, Down to Earth. Una Merkel is soon to be seen in the Eagle Lion picture, Texas Legend. In the cast, with Lee Bowman and Una Merkel, were Ken Christie as the editor, Herb Butterfield as Dr. Landsteiner, Elliot Reed as Dr. Wiener, Stanley Waxman as Dr. Levine, and Jerry Hausner, Howard McNear, Ann Tobin, and Hugh Thomas. This is John Heaston inviting you to listen next week to Ida Lupino in Lady of Distinction on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. (laughs) Cavalcade of America came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.